few little slides here for you today. I just wanted to have a good time talking about some stuff and I run into and stuff I've noticed and stuff I've uh, you know, figured out along the way. And uh, this first little thing I'm going to show you here, uh, this is a little situation where uh, the maintenance man had a Mazda B2300 and he had a sudden rough idle that just all of a sudden happened. And so I said, well, goodness gracious, is that you could even hear a big vacuum leak? And I'm thinking, where in the world is this coming from? Didn't see any unhooked hoses or anything. So we went ahead and uh, we capped off the throttle body and we pumped some, uh, the, with the smoke machine, we pumped some smoke into, a intake, uh, into the intake with the smoke machine. And we saw a whole lot of smoke coming from this area down here. So whenever we got to it, I think if I remember right, we had to pull a power steering pump off. We found this little plug had popped out of its hole right here, and it was just laying there. It was a little neat little shelf for it to lay on underneath it. And that little thing uh, had left a huge hole. Psh, I don't know what the original purpose of that hole was and why they put that hole there and then put that cap over it. But I went ahead and put some epoxy on that thing and stuck it back in the hole and took care of that problem. I wasn't going to see any point in erasing that. These right here also, though, they have a little uh, little butterfly valves in the intake that have a tendency to make racket and all that. And you got to replace the whole intake to care, take care of that. But that was a different problem than this. We ran into that later on on this truck. Uh, but anyway, that was an interesting little thing I thought I'd share with you. The smoke machine is about the handiest way to find a leak in the exhaust system or the uh, evaporative system. Of course, you know, sometimes a leak in the evaporator system will be really small difficult to see with the smoke machine and before you can fill up before you can check it with a evaporative system you got to take the gas cap off and you got to keep pumping your smoke in there until it's there's the whole system has got smoke in it and then you put the gas cap back on when the smoke starts coming out of the gas cap and then you look for where else it might be spurting out with a bright light in this case I didn't need a bright light you can see a whole lot of smoke coming out of there now this one right here is one of those things about when you know you've found it. You know, you've been fighting with something and you're saying, ah, look at here, you know, when you unplug the thing and you look, and this is so obvious right here, particularly if it was a circuit in question. Sometimes that wire may be broke loose right down inside the connector where you can't see it. And also, uh, there was a 2006 uh, Impala that I was, we were looking at that wouldn't come out of park. And so I got in there and I said, well, it won't come out of park, so obviously the shift interlock is not working. Uh, you figured out that, you know, you can mash the little button on the side of the sh shift column housing and get it to come out of park that way. But the little solenoid wasn't working. And so I got the scan tool, plugged it in, and on that particular one, the brake, uh, the stoplight switch sends a signal to the body computer, and the body computer turns on the you know, does everything else that is supposed to be done when you apply the brake and all that to include canceling crews and everything else. And so uh, I went down in there with the, into the console and looked, and I found this kind of hogwash going on down there at that wire. And when you move the shifter on that Impala, you're bending those wires. And it kept bending right there next to the, all those years, right there next to the, uh, where it was crimped into the connector until it just came loose from the connector. And all of a sudden, without warning, she couldn't get that thing uh, to come out of park. And so it was a situation kind of like that. You know, and I showed you on another slide, on another video uh, how you basically put that back together. you got to put it back together. You pinch it around there and you got to solder it so this will slide right back in there where it came from. Uh, but that was a cool little thing there. I don't remember what vehicle this was or what the situation was, but when we found it, we found it. it was supposed This was supposed to be going right in there and all that. So. Now these Chevy uh, truck oil pan leaks, we wound up, uh, I wrote a Motor Age article about two of them we had in one week, and I called that article pan handling. And we basically had to take the pan, the oil pan off of two of these Chevy uh, 5.3s and replace the pan gasket because it was leaking back in this area right here. You can see the oil dripping right there. Um, there is a uh, an interesting little uh, blurb that uh, Chevy and Ford came out with talking about using oil. They said if it if it's not using over a quart every thousand miles, uh, then that then that's not too much. Ford and Chevy both came up with that. Or if there's a leak it's making a little drip like that but it's not making it to the ground 
when the vehicle is parked, the warranty people didn't want to fix the leak like that either, because you're going to see, you know, the uh, leaks and oil consumption are all on a sliding scale. Now, I thought a quarter of a thousand miles was pretty excessive, um, but one way or another. Something else that I've been noticing, my friend uh, Alan, he called me and he said uh, that he's got a Chevrolet truck, it's a 07 with a 5.3. And, uh, you know, I've, had, I've got a little dab of history with that truck anyway. But one way or another, he says, uh, uh, my truck went low on coolant. I mean, it tried to get a little hot and it went low on coolant. And I said, he said, I filled it up with coolant and everything seems fine. I've been driving it. I wonder where the coolant went. And I said, well, you know, typically it goes, uh, it actually, believe it or not, it weeps out through rubber hoses. Uh, and it, it's worse to do that um, on believe it or not, on silicone hoses like they use on police cars than it is on regular rubber hoses, but it still weeps out. So the point in a hose isn't wet or anything, but you just, it just goes away. Also, it'll, it'll ease past the head gasket, and it will go in there, and it'll get used in the combustion chamber. And so he says, I says, keep a check on your coolant in the reservoir, and that way you won't fall into that trap. And we also need to know how fast that coolant's getting gone. Now, if you're driving it for 20 or 30 miles and it goes low on coolant, you've got to add some. That's, that's, a big, that's a serious problem. I said, but if you drive that thing for a month or two before it gets even a quart low on coolant in that, uh, in that reservoir, in that surge tank, it's basically a pressurized tank on that one, you know. I says, and I don't think I'd worry with that. I'd just make sure I kept it topped off with a 50-50 you know, mix of distilled water and the right kind of coolant and uh, do it that way. And uh, so... So then he called, and his, his wife drives a 13 Ford EcoBoost. So he called and said, uh, about, heck, it must have been six weeks later, he called and said that her truck had done the same thing, and it had gone low on coolant, and I uh, tried to overheat. So they had to add the coolant, and it seemed like it was okay at this point in time. I said, well, that's interesting. That's two trucks in the same family that did that, one a Chevrolet and one a Ford. And so I went out there and, and opened up my 07 F-150, and lo and behold, it didn't overheat on me or anything, but I just looked over there at the uh, the coolant pressure tank, you know, you know the tank where you can see how much coolant you got, and doggone if it wasn't about out of coolant. <laughs> so I got some Motorcraft Gold, which is about the best coolant I know of, and uh, I put that, I mixed it with some distilled water, and I put that in there. And uh, it takes probably, and I drive that thing, you know, two or three times a week, and it will take months and months before that coolant ever begins to even go a little bit low again. So I was having the same issue that he was having. But that's a good rate. You need to check fairly regularly the brake fluid because as the pads wear out, the brake fluid goes low in the master cylinder. And incidentally, I'm going to have to put a master cylinder on my Explorer because I noticed I got pedal falling out from under my foot. And it's the second master cylinder I've had to put on that thing the last five years. I don't know what I'm going to ah, a little irritated about that. But, uh... My goodness, cars cost so much nowadays if you buy a new or an almost new and you're going to pay thirty or forty thousand dollars for what you used to be able to get for half of that, you know. And so it's the best idea to keep the ones that you've got going and running smooth. Um, and that way you don't, you know, empty your bank account or have big payments or something like that. And so, anyway, so it's always a good idea to check the coolant, uh, the, the tank, and it's a good idea. And here's another thing if you've got a rusty looking dirty tank you know, you know you go ahead and flush your cooling system and put a fresh tank on there so you can see how much coolant is in there because occasionally believe it or not sometimes those tanks will split or crack or something like that and you can lose enough coolant it's almost as bad as and it can be as bad as a crack in a radiator and those tanks can crack too think about all this heat and pressure that you're putting that plastic through anyway keep an eye on your coolant keep an eye on your uh, obviously pull your dipstick on your uh, uh, engine you know you want to make sure that it doesn't go low on oil too but uh keeping all those fluid levels checked look under there and see what you can find one time i was teaching my students over there at the college about belt tensioners and stuff uh, it was a, a fundamentals class and we went and opened the hood on all of their vehicles and one of those guys had a belt tensioner that was coming apart to the point to where it was just about to throw the belt off that thing and he had no clue that was about to happen and he actually had a fairly long drive to school too it's really something, though, how we can drive a long way on a vehicle and not have any trouble at all. There was another student, a woman that she was about 50 years old, she drove Power Stroke Diesel. It was an older one, a lot of miles on it. And she drove it from, I'll probably say probably 25 miles to get to the college. 
And she was enrolled in my program. And uh, so she took her uh, power stroke and she parked it out there and she said, uh, told me right after the class session, she goes, I'm going to move my truck to such a, to a different parking place for whatever is out there while she's moving her truck. But as she was moving her truck, the uh, one of the tie rod ends came apart and she lost all the steering. And you know, she drove 60, 70 miles an hour from where she came over here and it was a parking lot maneuver. Of course, to be perfectly honest, a parking lot maneuver is when you're working your steering components the hardest. It's a whole lot better to have the vehicle moving in a forward direction when you turn the wheels and it doesn't put quite so much stress on that. The president of the college, his son, was driving a 71 El Dorado and he, he was turning his wheels in a parking lot and that thing uh, sheared the uh, pitman arm, you know, the little pitman arm ball. It just popped it off there and suddenly he was moving his pitman arm but his steering wasn't responding. That happened during a parking lot maneuver at a fast food place. Uh, and, you know, fortunately it didn't happen while he was driving down the road 60 miles an hour and just losing your steering like that. Uh, there was this guy, though, that I was behind one time coming from Sabine Pass back to Port Arthur when I worked down there. And he was driving a 77 Dodge pickup truck. And uh, I was just following along behind him, not, you know, not paying attention to anything. It was kind of a straight road. And all of a sudden, it, he, I could see his tailgate start doing this. And he was all over the road just without warning. And he went over into the other lane. Then he wound up working his way off over onto the shoulder. And a tie rod end had come apart on him while he was driving on the highway. And, the, you know, of course, when the tie wore out in and came apart, the right front wheel started doing this shopping cart thing. You know, that kind of stuff can happen without warning. And uh, if there had been a big truck, a dump truck or something, or even a regular car coming the other way, somebody would have been killed because he was all over in that other lane trying to get control of that thing. It was nasty. And um, there was this other guy, well, this other truck that we drove that was another 77 model Dodge that actually... It had, the one he was driving had been a company truck, you know, and he put lots of miles on it and it bounced around in the yard out there and all that. Uh, but we had uh, driven one to, to lunch and back. We only had a 30 minute lunch and they let us, you know, we take a company truck because we, we were in charge of fixing the trucks and everything anyway. Well, we took one of the company trucks to lunch down at the Sabini Cafe. We came back uh, and the guy that was doing the greasing the cranes, he took it all throughout the yard driving it around. When he pulled back into the shop, it had a big iron bumper that we had built on it for whatever reason. I don't remember why. Um, as soon as he was parking that thing, the lower ball joint on the left side broke. I mean, it, it, it didn't pop out of his ball. That thing popped, and that bumper hit the ground like a ton of bricks. Scared the daylights out of everybody. And so what we did was, when we got it up, I saw that that thing had been cracked about halfway through for a long time because the metal was discolored. And whenever it finally broke, it broke all at once the rest of the way. So half of that break was really shiny and the other half you could tell had been cracked. Now that's not the kind of thing you typically notice because it's buried inside that boot with all that grease. But metal fatigue, whatever, I don't know. But we bounced around a lot out there driving around the dock area. But I was thinking about the fact that we were driving to this cafe and back on that doggone thing. And then he happened to be pulling it into the shop later that day when that thing came apart. It had killed us all, you know. That thing hits the ground like that, you know it's going to flip in over in. Went none of area one of us wearing a dead gum seat belt. All right, this was something I had fun. This is fake news for fun. The, the uh, English professor one day had seen this in the paper, and he showed me this and he said, "Hey, I wanted to make this to make fun of the diesel department down there." And so I says, "Well, I can use my Photoshop capabilities, and I can take that and make it look like a regular newspaper uh, headline thing." And so. I went ahead and uh, put diesel technology students enjoy break after learning safety tips for storing, storing flammable chemicals. That was something the English instructor came up with. And then I added this one right here and put the instructor's picture down there. And that and I just sent that all over the campus. It was funny as all get out. You know, we just, we have fun uh, doing stuff like that. And, uh, and we it got posted on several bulletin boards. <laughs> But this guy had a terrific sense of humor, so he didn't mind that too much. Now this guy right here, this was that, that program I started, and it was a brand new program. You could tell the concrete's brand new and all that. 
and I had outfitted it with tools and all that kind of thing. You don't often get a chance to do that, to just start a new program from scratch. Uh, that was a dual enrollment program. And this guy right here was really into his work. I mean, this guy right here, and he's uh, he's actually a mechanic in somewhere now, uh, and he, he was really smart. He had a lot of snap, and I really thought, that I could tell this guy was really going to go places because he wasn't afraid of anything. Uh, whatever I gave him to do, he would like us to do it. And he was good with electrical and all kinds of stuff, and just as smart as a whip. Uh, but that I, I saw his hands were nice and greasy that one day. I, you know, this was actually before uh, school. He came to see me before he went to his regular school. He stayed a couple of hours, and I'd give all those guys plenty of work to do and all that. But uh, now this right here was at my regular automotive program over there. You can tell those chairs have been there since 1965 because how old they are. But anyway, this guy right here was working his way through a final exam. I had a five-part final exam for electrical and this little board right here and this little power supply I had a 12 volt electric power supply feeding this and I call that the juice box and I would use these little uh, I'd have them take and go from you know I had these marked hot and negative and I'd have them wire up this circuit right here and basically they would put the ground on this side they put the power over here when you close the switch the current would flow through the resistor and you notice everything that a, a standard meter does, you know, the most standard stuff, not measuring hertz or temperature or anything like that, but I started out by using the ohms. Measure, see the ceramic resistor, I had two 10 ohm resistors there and it makes five ohms when you put them parallel. All right, measure resistance of the resistor, write it down. Measure the resistance of the bulb, write it down. Using the jumper wires, the resistors, and the schematic below, build the circuit as shown on the board. So they had to look at that and build this little simple circuit. Easy as pie, right? You'd be surprised, and I put this together for a Skills USA competition, a local one, to decide who was going to go to, you know, compete at the state or whatever. And I would put that little board down there, and these guys were high school autom automotive students, and they would come through there, and they would sit down at that table. They were looking at this right here, and they were looking at that little board and all they had to do was hook ground here, power there, follow these instructions, you know, whenever they got ready to build it. Perform a voltage drop measurement between the power source and the bulb with the switch closed and the lamp illuminated. So they would turn on the switch, the little toggle switch there, the lamp would come on, and they were supposed to do a voltage drop of that whole circuit. Now, obviously, if you've got 10 ohms of resistance, the light's going to come on. You notice I've got these suspended up off the board so that the plexiglass wouldn't get burned by those hot resistors and I've also got a little uh, word written I'm going to say hot do not touch you know because some people are dumb enough to touch a ceramic resistor that had current flowing through it and burn their fingers and so anyway I'd say all right so measure available voltage well you measure voltage drop voltage drop measurement you know where you would go uh, you would start right here at your 12 volt I, you know, I would accept it if they went here and then if they went to the hot side of the bulb which would be here and they told me how much voltage was being dropped between the power source and the hot side of the bulb. That's, t that's a voltage drop measurement, it's real important. And that, they would write that down. Measure the voltage available at the lamp while the lamp was illuminated. And they're going to do that right here, right? Okay, so set your meter to read amps and measure how many amps the bulb is consuming. So they had to know how to do that. So they'd have to set it on amps. They know how to set their meter up. See, I'm sitting here. And I'm basically, rather than being an instructor at this point, I'm a judge. I'm judging what they're doing, and I'm seeing if they know what they're doing. Do they know how to set it up to read amps? Do they know how to measure voltage drop? I mean, anybody that knows their stuff can sail through this without any problem at all. When I went to that uh, competition, and I only hosted one of the stands, there was another one over there where the guy had a mic and a camshaft and all that kind of stuff. And these uh, guys would come through there, and this one character, he was looking at the two wires coming off of the little power supply here. He was getting ready to hook those to each side of the switch. He was going to hook one here and the other one there from here. So when I saw he was getting ready to do that, at that point, like I say, I wasn't his instructor. I was a judge. He had another instructor somewhere, I don't know, from a, from a local high school. And uh, I had my arms folded and I was watching him. I said, stop. So he stopped and he looked at me. I says, unhook your jumper wires. So he unhooked his jumper wires. 
And I says, now lay your jumper wires down. And he did. And I says, now lean back because you're done. What? What are you talking about? What do you mean I'm done? He says, look, when you're trying to hook power and ground to each side of a switch and you're going to turn that switch on, you're going to blow a fuse or let the smoke out of something. And if you don't know any more about how to wire up a circuit than that, you don't even need to be sitting in that chair. I mean, that sounds a little harsh, but good grief, you know. Somebody that can't wire up a, a circuit like this. And look how easy it is. It's astonishing how people struggle with that. Now, the fact that it was there was so much on the line may have made them a little nervous. But I, what I found out when I'm taking a test is just relax and don't get yourself all stressed out. You'll typically do a whole lot better. All right. So then I would have them to measure the voltage, set, set it to read amps, measure how many amps it's consuming. Using the source voltage and the measured amperage in this little EIR table, use the Ohm's Law formula to determine and write calculated resistance of the circuit while the bulb is illuminating. Well, what you would find out is that whenever the bulb is burning, it's got about 5 ohms of resistance, but whenever you measured it with a meter when it wasn't burning, it's only got about 8 tenths of an ohm or something like that, or maybe a, a 1 ohm. And so I said, how does the calculated resistance differ from the measured resistance, which is obviously going to be higher? And then I'd say, why? And I would expect them to write that down. Now, that was, uh, collectively, these two boards were part one of a five-part final. And uh, anyway, so the next thing that I had them do, see, this right here is what they had to wire up. Next thing I had them do, I built this little board, and these are little bug switches. I told them, don't touch those bug switches or you'll be disqualified. Leave those alone. You can't tell if they're switched on or off. All the wires are black under that board, so you can't tell where they go. And what I would do is I would take, I had two relays that looked exactly alike, and I had taken one of them apart, and I had, you know, mixed, fixed it where it wouldn't work. And so I had one bad relay, and I could use that for a bug, or I could mash any of those wires that would break various different circuits and all. What's supposed to happen, and this thing was already wired up for them, they didn't have to wire that up, but when they mash that button, that relay would operate that fan. You can see I had it wired up. I actually had them a schematic like this. So they've got a schematic, they've got a live world circuit, a real world circuit, and I even showed them how the relay terminals, you know, call, call, normally open, common, and not used right there in the middle is your rate relay pin out. And so the deal was, I says, first I want you to trace the path to ground and trace the path to power the way it goes when the circuit's working. Okay, there's your motor, there's your switch, and I had them laid out the same way that was. And they were looking at it, you know, with it turned around, you can see that he had the switch. Now these switches weren't on the schematic because they didn't need to be. Okay, so they would mash that and that wasn't going to work. It never worked when I put them there. And it either it might be one of those or it might be. So what they had to do was they had this cheap little LED test light and they would pull the relay out of there and I told them, I said, if you ask me for another relay and you plug in another relay and that doesn't fix the problem, you're done with this exercise and you're going to get a crappy score. Okay, so I would have them pull the relay out and lay it over here to the side and I had another relay that I could, you know, that I could give them if they decided to ask for a relay. And I might have put a bad relay in there. But how did they know? Well, what they would do is they'd unplug that relay and they would energize the circuit with their little button. You know, pushing the button. Basically, if you look at the button, the button is supposed to ground the relay, right? So you ground over here. It's supposed to ground the relay when you mash the button. So with that button mashed, you ought to see ground here. You ought to see ground here because it's coming through the motor, right? And then you ought to see power on both of those. So if you've got on your common terminal, basically the common terminal is this one up here. And you ought to see power here, and you ought to see power to one side of the coil, and you ought to see ground on these two. Now, if you've mashed that button and you don't see two grounds and two powers, you need to find out which one I was missing. And you know, basically I would tell them, once you find out where the problem is, show me on this circuit where your problem is. You see how simple that was and how it basically provided you a schematic, it provided you a real world circuit that worked or didn't work objectively. If they had two powers and two grounds and they held out their hands for a relay and they had them a relay and they plugged it in and the fan ran, they made a perfect score. You see how that worked? Um, and I actually crafted this for competitions, but it worked really, really good for part of the final because it ran them through troubleshooting a circuit. It also ran them through everything they were supposed to know how to do with their meter. And it made sure they understood voltage drop. There's all kinds of cool stuff that I could do with these two boards. I came up with these all by myself. 
they didn't cost very much and I really like the stuff that some of these professional training companies use but one of the things that I found out and I mentioned this the other day was if they are wiring it up themselves and having to make it work they're going to understand it a lot better than it is looking at some fancy cutaway something and they say look at it for a minute or two and they say oh yeah well I've seen, I understand this now now what's next you know so basically I want them to have to work on it. What I found out was the more they wired this stuff up the better they got at it the more they enjoyed it and I would find them doing it for fun you know which is cool because they get to where they really burn it in and understand it that way all right now this fan board I've kind of showed before but you can see the three relays you can see the battery you see two motors and you see I gave them this schematic and I say use this schematic to wire up so you can see the guy's got it right there in front of him to wire up this and when you turn that one on both fans ought to be running on half, you know, they're running basically running in series, which means they're splitting the voltage between them. They run at half speed. You mash that, they kick on in high speed. And see, that's proofs in the pudding on that. You can wire it up. What was funny to me was you could let another student watch these guys wire it up. You could let them take a picture of that with their phone. There's no way on earth you could cheat on this because if you didn't do it right, it wasn't going to work right. And this looked like spaghetti when you take a picture of it. You understand what I'm saying but I had one student that could wire this thing up and see my so in the holes there this is what was so dumb when I built this board I put those holes there I guess so the air would have somewhere to go but I got to thinking about that and I says those holes didn't even need to be there I mean that was the dumbest thing I ever did because those fans all they need to do is spin so uh, I got to thinking but I made some two inch holes in, around there just sort of for looks I guess and uh, there was a guy that got really 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 good at wiring this up and he could wire it up without the schematic he was really good at it he had practiced it so much that he could just he could just about do it with eyes closed so he would wire that thing up and then he would show everybody how it was working and he got to where he would lay his hand up on top of the board while he was turning it on and somehow he managed to get his finger through one of those holes and that fan knocked his fingernail slam off and so I said, I need to do something about that. So I bought one of those little uh, mesh things, the old netted thing that you put on the front of your vehicle to keep the bugs from splattering them. And I cut it up and I basically stapled it so that there was a screen over those holes where nobody could get their finger in there. That's one of those things I should have anticipated, but I didn't. He didn't make a big stink out of it because he was the one that did it to himself. And nobody told him to put his hand up there. You know, I probably should have put a sign or something. You know, But anyway, he learned the hard way. The thing about that guy, he was really good at doing this, but everything else in the whole shop that I tried to get him to do, he was worthless. He could not do anything to fix anything. It would take him a half a day to scrape a gasket. I mean, I was thinking, you know, this guy right here, for some reason, he re this resonated with him, but he couldn't do anything in the shop. Now, I had other people that could do this really good in the... I had a... That 350 Chevy engine that we I'd pull the distributor out and throw it over where the wires are, and I'd make them pop the, uh, you know, find the place to put the, find number one top dead center compression, put the distributor in there, put it in, you know, put the distributor cap on it, wire it up, and fire it up. And I had one guy that could do that in three minutes. I'd pull the wires off, I'd pull the cap off, I'd put them over on a little rolling table, and I would spin the engine over, and he had to do all of that, and he could do it. And usually between three and four minutes, I think his best time might have been three minutes and 20 seconds or something like that. I had another guy that could do it in six minutes. And I think there's a video on my uh, YouTube channel somewhere of that guy doing that. Anyway, now this guy right here, this was over at that new program that I put together. This is the same guy that had the dirty hands in the shop. And this guy right here held this poster up over him because he said, I can do this blindfolded. And basically on that one, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to hook it up so that when you mash that button, the motor turns one way and you mash that button, it turns the other way using these two relays and those two switches. And what you got to do is you got to go from the common to here and the common to here. And you got to ground both of these. And then you're going to take your power and you're going to put power here, power here. You're going to ground that one, ground that one. And you're going to have your switch operate in the call. And so the one that clicks over is basically the one that's going to be providing power because you got power here and ground here, right? So they're both grounded until you mash this button. Power suddenly is feeding this one while this one's still grounded. It's the one that's at rest grounded. Mash that one, the opposite happens. So it goes, well, this guy right here had a little whirly light that you put on top of your car if you want to be a volunteer fireman or something. 
and that guy would uh, and it would the bulb would turn one way and then the other. I built that from scratch too with an old piece of plexiglass stand that I had, and so that guy was uh, was really good at that. And of course, you got to have a 12 volt power supply handy to do all this kind of stuff, and I had that. But he did it blindfolded, and he was really good at that. This was one of the first boards I built for people to wire up one like this. It was on a white wooden board, and it had a whirly light like that on it, and it worked really good. Now, the transmission starving for fluid. This was one that came in, and they said, well, I start out, and I go a little bit, and then I get to where the transmission won't go um, before I even get anywhere. In other words, he'd be driving about 100, 150 yards, and it started out pulling just fine, and then it got to where it would, you know, sort of try to neutralize on me. Full of fluid, no problem there. And so we went ahead and pulled out, had one of these metal screen filters in it, like some of your old C6 and C4 Fords used to have. This was on a Nissan, if I remember right. And so we pulled this off there, and we found all that nastiness up in there. I went ahead and bought a new filter to put on there, but this one could have been washed out. And then we put all that back together and put in some fresh fluid. I think we did a fluid exchange on it, and he was, he, he was good to go. Well, my son, Matt, bought this 96 Chevrolet pickup from my dad for a thousand dollars and it was one of the CSFI system it ran really good and my dad had been driving it but he never really drove it all that far so my son bought it and he was going to head back to Mississippi on it so he gets about 20 miles up the road and he gets where the transmission won't pull and so I had already retired so I took it over there to the school and they were trying to figure out what was wrong with it and the guy that was an instructor at the time was a pretty doggone good transmission guy and, and he's real familiar with that uh, that uh, 700 R4 transmission. So he tears it down. He goes, I cannot find anything wrong with this transmission. All the parts look really, really good. He said, I don't see any hard seals. The clutches and all are nearly brand new. It's like somebody just went and rebuilt this thing. But why it quit pulling, I don't know. And I don't know that they are in a pressure check, which they probably should have. But you know, when you're caught up, you know, trying to do stuff with students and all, sometimes it's hard to think clearly. I mean, I, I knew my best thinking when I'm by myself and there's nobody bothering me. But anyway, what happened was, Whoever rebuilt that transmission, it was supposed to have a pan like this deep one on it. They put a shallow pan on it, and they managed to cram it up there, and whenever they tightened the bolts, it squished up against the filter. Now, this was discovered after they were putting the transmission back together, after they put new clutches and seals in it and everything. The, the instructor called me and said, this thing's got the wrong pan on it. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, it's supposed to have a deep pan, but it's got a shallow pan, and it's really squishing the filter hard. And I says, that's why it quit pulling after 20 miles, because it was starving the transmission for fluid. I mean, that was very easy to miss when you're going in there, you know, like I say, if you do a really carefully, you know, you can understand how when you look under there, this looks perfectly normal. If you don't know it's supposed to have a deep pan, it's got a shallow pan on it. It's switching the filter, but you don't really notice that when you're taking it off if you've never seen it before. I mean, this kind of thing is one of those perfect storm situations. Well, anyway, the, the, the transmission eventually got straightened out. My, my son took it back to Mississippi with him and all that, and he's really happy as a lark. He wouldn't take nothing with that ratty old truck now. And it's a long, uh, one of them long wheelbase super cab, you know, 96 Chevrolets with a, got a 5.0 in it. Uh, but that is a fine truck. I, we worked on that thing. Uh, and I actually put one of those electronic CSFI spiders in it because it was my dad's truck. And then I put the little uh, chip. Uh, I kept looking for, I got the uh, salvage yard guy bring me a bunch of engine controllers he had. And I kept moving, you know, putting chips in there until I found one that made it run really, really smooth because it had some other kind of a problem. And you couldn't even buy those chips that I knew about unless you paid a lot of money for them waited for it to get there. But I just swapped a bunch of them out. But the, the, the salvage yard guy was pretty sharp. But he told me, he says, you know, there's not any number on these things or any way I can tell what fits what. Anyway, but that's one way or another. That was a smooth, that's a smooth running truck and it still runs good. It gets really good fuel economy. But whenever he filled it up and take it back up there, and this was before the fuel come back up here recently, I think it was Labor Day two years ago, um, he had to put $88 worth of fuel in that thing to fill it up. Anyway, this was an advisory committee meeting. <clears throat> these people would come and... Uh, we, you know, they would tell me, you know how advisory committee works, you know, what you do is you tell them what you're doing, they let, you let them look at the work that the students are doing in the shop, and you basically ask them, okay, what do you guys need me to teach? Uh, where are you, the people you hire, where are they light in their knowledge? What do you need them to know whenever they leave here and come to where you're at? Uh, this guy right here owns a great big car dealership that's really successful. 
This guy owns a tire store. That's his shop for him. And this guy here was the instructor from the high school. And this guy here was the, uh, he basically was in charge of that new program I set up over there. This guy right here represented the parts uh, store. And this guy right here had a shop right there in town. And this guy right here had a really nice used car dealership. So that night, that was my advisory committee. Now these little bins over here is where I'd put the students' work. Everybody had their own little number. Everybody's number was their number. Kind of like you have a, you know, mechanic numbers at a dealership. And whenever I would get those, uh, I would hand them their work. Basically, I mean, I would print out their work that they were supposed to do, whatever courses they were enrolled in, and I would put those in there. So when, some, when the student came in there, they could go and they could find the written tests they were supposed to do that day, the worksheets they needed to do to complete that day's work, and when they got through with it, I had a numbered rack of uh, file, a fold, I mean, paper holders on the wall out there by my office, and everybody had their own little number, and they would drop their work in there, so it was already sorted out for me. So I could go out there one at a time, get their work out, put it in the computer in my spreadsheet, and then drop it in a file folder. Worked good for me. There was actually another set of these over here, and there's another set of these over here, because sometimes I have quite a few students if you counted the dual enrollment and the regular folly students. That was my teaching desk right there. This is the chair I was always sitting in when you see the videos I made with the whiteboard behind me over here. I'm looking out at these guys and I'm doing that and there with my uh, power, I mean my thing. I actually built that. I ran those cords up there and uh, the, the electronics instructor says, why don't you run them down through the ceiling? I said, because if there's some kind of a problem, I want to be able to just reach up there and work on that darn thing instead of having to you know, get the ladder in here with the maintenance man and all that and go up there and see what's wrong. And that, that helped me several times. Anyway, you can kind of get an idea of what I was uh, doing here. That uh, the measuring, uh, I was showing everybody how you measured uh, torque converter end play using that tool right there. I don't know of any shops that do that. Most of the time somebody's doing a transmission overall, they just throw a torque converter at it. Anyhow, these were, the, these, these were full of old, outdated shop manuals and stuff. Uh, and uh, textbooks and that kind of hogwash whenever I first came there. And uh, the library uh, wanted me to give them an inventory of all the books I had. So I took all of them crappy old books that we weren't ever going to use anymore, and I put them in the back of one of the trainer trucks. And then I filled these up with components that I, where I would, if I was talking about something like a catalytic converter or maybe a air conditioner control head, I could go and pick it up. I could show up stuff and all that. This is a totally different looking place now. It doesn't look anything like this anymore, but that's what it looked like when I was there. That's an old board with some stuff on it that a previous instructor had built a long time ago. There's a fan motor up there and you see all that stuff. All right. Now, don't you love where Toyota and Lexus like to pop those starters under the intake manifold? Wasn't that brilliant? Now, a couple of years after this, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is an 04. 07, they moved that starter down there on the side of the block where you got to pull the exhaust manifold. Instead of having to pull the intake manifold, you got to pull the pipe and the snake skin and all that hogwash off and exhaust manifold to get the starter out. The starter replacement on one of those 07, and we had to do one of those in the automotive department because somebody said, hey, my starter died. And I got a starter and my students worked there. They're like a five and a half hour labor charge on one of them Toyota Tundras with that V8 in it to put that starter on there, the one that's down there. This one here, though, is right under the intake. And uh, the Lexus started that way back in the 90s on some of their uh, engines and stuff. So that wasn't terribly unusual. And it's not all that difficult, really, to get this manifold off. You know, if you've done it a few times, you can jerk it off and pop it back on real fast. Uh, but anyway, that was just kind of crazy. Now, this right here is that one student. This guy right here was always a student that had his hands on something. Now, the thing about this, and there's some confusion about this, I had posted on my... You know, on a, on a Facebook page I have where there's a bunch of other mechanics, and uh, they said, "Well, you know, you know, you, you, somebody should have uh, planned this better or whatever, and given these stuff." The, what I didn't, what I got to understand was, I have given, I've given everybody the work they're supposed to do for that day, wherever that work is, whatever that work is. Everybody's got work they're supposed to do. Well, invariably, I would come over there, and I would see two or three guys standing around watching one guy work. And when they saw me coming, they would act like they were putting their hands on it and working. You know, the instructor would always, I mean, the uh, students always think the instructor is stupid. And I'd say, what are you guys doing over here? How come you're not working on the work I gave you to do on the other side of the shop? Ha, ha, I'm, I'm helping, him, helping him. Well, really what they were doing was socializing. That happens in garages, too. 
And I told this one guy, Jimmy, that's uh, such a good mechanic over here, I told him, I says, the people that are standing around the water fountain or the coffee pot or hanging out in the parks room socializing are going to be the ones grousing because they didn't make enough money at the end of the week. And I says, if you keep your nose to the grindstone and you get work done, you'll have a nice solid paycheck at the end of the week and they'll be crying in their soup. And, if, and he says, you know, he told me about, I don't know, I went and see him about two or three months ago over there while he was working. He says, that thing you told us, one of them was, if you're the one standing around the water cooler, expect not to have a good check at the end of the week. He said, I see that every week. He said, there's always somebody wasting time standing around here talking when they ought to be working. And he says, and they're always crying at the end of the week because they didn't turn enough hours. He said, I ain't got no problem turning hours myself. Um, and I said, Some, uh, something else I told my students, I says, when you're headed for the parts room, you grab your clipboard with your work order on it or whatever you got to take in there. Have the part number, if you can, already written down so you'll be able to tell them just what you need. can't always do that, but if you can, it helps them do it faster. You head for that parts room like you're walking, like you're, head, like you're late for an appointment. You walk really fast, you go straight to the parts room, you don't pass go, you don't collect $200, you go to the parts room, you do everything you can to get in and out of that parts room just as fast as you can. You get back over here, you get your work done, pull the car. I don't care if you've turned 12 hours already and it's just noon. You draw every job you can and turn every hour you can because you don't know what tomorrow's going to be like around being at work in the shop. You can't ever tell from one day to the next. So make hay while the sun shines. Walk fast when you're on the way to the parts room. Get your work done. Try to do it efficiently without making mistakes or having comebacks. But be focusing on where you are and what you're doing and think about is what I'm doing moving me toward getting another work order and getting a shop getting one worked out. This guy I got right here has got a shop in Zimbabwe, Africa. And he is, and I'm not kidding when I say this, and I, there's a lot of people in the industry that do training and everything that would agree with me on this. Nobody would disagree. This guy is probably one of the very best mechanics on the surface of the earth. And I'm not kidding. He is really, really good. There's just about nothing this guy can't do. And whenever he publishes a scope pattern where he has scoped something, he's got some of the best little bubbles pointing out, little points on I mean, it's just astonishing what he, what this guy is able to do and the stuff he's able to fix. And he does diesel, he does electronics, he does transmission. There's nothing this guy doesn't know how to do. And he runs his own shop in Africa, but he comes to the training uh, over here in this country, and that's where I saw him. And, uh, and that was, uh, you know, I put my motor read shirt on and all that. And he found me and he says, hey, I want to take a selfie with you. Well, this guy watches these videos. He may be watching this one. I don't know. But the simple fact is this is a tremendously high, uh, quality, high quality mechanic that really, really, really knows his stuff. Got a tremendous amount of respect for him. Everybody else that knows him does too. And he has got more ASC certifications than just than you would imagine. I mean, you know, I've got 10 myself. I think he's got 20 <laughs> or 25 ASC certifications because they got that many different ones. Uh, I'm telling you, anyway, I couldn't say enough about him. Of course, you know, he's been real generous here talking about automotive technology training instructor. And he had his selfie stick up there and took a picture of me and him. This right here, real work is the key to training. And whenever I could, I always had my people do real work. Now, these are live work jobs, right? This is a cool little... Uh, there was a deal like this at the Lincoln place over there, but it had a chain fall like this instead of an electric one. And this was handy in the shirt pocket. Only problem is they mounted this in such a way... I mean, they should have moved this thing farther forward. This, this rail, when it was built, that was there before I got there, but it's really well done. And you roll this... Uh, hoist back and forth and you can actually work in that bay or this bay and it was like a two and a half ton of hoist or something like that. It was really good. Eventually it, it wore out though and there was something broke up in it and it was still broke whenever I retired and I you know, kept trying to order parts for it. But anyway, but you could, we pull the transmission, we pull the, unhook all the wire and everything, lift the motor off of its mount, set the other motor back down in there, hook up all the wires, put the mount bolts in and then we put the transmission in. You know, that was basic, basically having the transmission still in the truck and having to work that engine down there and stab it into that. It ain't that hard to pull the transmission out. While you got it out, just go ahead and replace the seals. 
in a transmission too, you know, the torque converter seal and all that kind of stuff. Why not? Steam clean it if it's got mud on it and everything. You got a nice clean tar train, you can go back in there with it. Alright. You're only and I, I put this on the wall over there. You're only here because you feel like it. You're gonna you feel like you have to be and you don't want to be, you're gonna fail. Performance, attitude, integrity, dependability, P A I D. Performance, attitude, integrity, and dependability. I came up with that when I was writing a lesson one time about four, five, six, eight years ago, and it just kind of stuck. But if you want to get paid, if you're short on performance, if you can't do the job, you're gonna have issues. You can have the best attitude, the most integrity, and you can be really dependable. But if you can't do the work, then these three right here, you might they might keep you around because they like you, but there's a lot of stuff you're not going to be able to do if you can't perform. Now, you can have this one and these two, but if your attitude stinks, you know, and that'd be unusual to find somebody with integrity and dependability and could perform that had a bad attitude, but I've seen that. I've also seen it with people that could perform and had a good attitude, but they didn't have any integrity. Sometimes they would basically... Um, there was this one guy that retired from the Ford place over there, and uh, when I went, they looked under his bench to clean out all of his junk. There was all kinds of brand new parts under there that he had charged a customer for, but he never put on it. And there was no way at that point to track how many times he had done that or how far back it went. Uh, dependability, if you've got performance, attitude, and integrity, some people might say these two are tied together. But I used to have some of these shop owners that would say, I have got guys here that can do anything. They got a good attitude. I just really like it when they're here because they can fix all kinds of stuff. But they only show up for work about three days a week. And the other two days they want to take off. You know, I knew one guy that would take off every Thursday because Friday was payday and he'd already earned all his hours by Wednesday. So Thursday was his day to take off. And they put up with that for a while before they finally let him go. Anyway, this is the last slide. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this time. Because I sure have fun doing these things, and I'll talk to you all next time.